it is time for uh, kind of like my final follow-up video. It's been a little while since I got the um, SQI Andy scan. Uh, you know, it's gosh, it's been, I'd have to look, but I want to say it's been four or five months now that I've had this, at least three or four months. And I haven't really done a lot of videos on it lately, but I've been using it a ton. In fact, I actually sold my Labradar uh, a couple months ago now, and uh, I honestly don't miss it. It was a great unit, and, and I'm not putting the Labradar down in any way. Um, it is, you know, a great unit that a lot of people really enjoy, and, you know, it probably has its place. Uh, for me, though, I just, the size and, and just some of the functionality things, uh, this has made my life so much easier. For one, uh, let's just, I mean, the size. Uh, without a doubt, being able to just throw this in my backpack when I go traveling, you know, for instance, I went to um, a couple matches this year where I was flying, and the ability to just throw this in my backpack, go on carry-on, which again, it's got uh, lithium batteries in it, you've got to put it in your carry-on, at least as of TSA rules today. Um, so this just goes in my carry-on, and this is all I need to bring. Uh, I could bring this, which I'll explain in a minute, it's just my tripod, uh, but really, I can use this on a bench, uh, or I can just bring one of the mounts with me if I want to. Uh, there's a lot of different options, but the bottom line is I can just bring this and easily record some values if I need to at a match. And it's always in my range bag. Um, I always struggle because there's days I'd forget my lab radar. Um, you know, it was in its own, you know, computer bag that I carried it in. And, um, you know, honestly, some days I just forgot it and it was frustrating. I'd get to the range, I'd be like, oh man, uh, all I was, trying to do today was capture velocities and I left my chronograph at home. This just is always in my range bag so I never have to worry about it. It does have, uh, as we've talked about, an internal battery. Uh, is it the longest life battery? No, but uh, I can get, depending on how I'm using it, between 40 minutes and an hour. Uh, if you're trying to do Wi-Fi connection, it's going to suck the battery up a lot more. I don't find myself, I don't know, okay, let me back up and say that I think using the Magneto Speed, which is a great unit, and the Lab Radar, which is also a good unit, like they're all good units. They just do things differently, right? And you kind of get trained how you use a certain kind of chronograph. And I have found that I've been untraining myself and and just using this differently. That's all. It doesn't make it a bad thing, uh, but I don't uh, I don't really do the Wi-Fi connection, and I'm not using the App Connect or the uh, the, like the Wi-Fi page to watch my data on my phone like I used to. And and why is that? Well, because I just don't care. Um, when this thing's popping up data, I'm usually writing it down anyway because I've got a logbook that I'm keeping it in or, or um, you know, some kind of a sheet that I'm using. So I'll just kind of take a quick record there. And if I need to get an electronic version, I can always download it and, and easily have that data. So I just don't find myself connecting the Wi-Fi like Originally, when I first got this, I was like, oh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. I just don't do that. I, I just, I watch the data as it goes on, and, and that's all I really need. Um, and again, if I need other data, I can download it. There's a lot of little functionality that goes on in here that is very unique to this unit in terms of um, how it tells you if a signal is good. Uh, I don't know if I can easily pull up a value for you here but give me a second let me see if i can find something uh real quick um so i don't think it's going to let me show you i'd have to pull it up differently but when you shoot on this thing it'll actually and he's got it in his book he'll sh it'll show you whether you're getting good signal or not and and i just um i haven't had any issues with it uh i was really concerned in the beginning about you know, uh, getting interference from other uh, shooters and their their sound uh, causing it to trigger. And I, I, I don't know. It's going to sound really stupid. I just, the things that used to bother me or worry me with my lab radar just haven't bothered me with this like I thought they would. Um, I do technically have one of his beta unit triggers. Uh, it is an optical sensor that snaps on top here and then it goes on your barrel and it will trigger uh, again. I was like, oh man, I got to try this, got to try this. I just don't really ever use it. Um, I just hook this up. It goes next to my barrel. I shoot. It captures my data. Do I miss a shot once in a while? Yeah, every once in a while. I might perfectly shoot at the same time as somebody else on the range. And, you know, maybe it triggers a second earlier so it misses my shot. Um, 
I just don't stress about it like I used to. But the size alone, again, has made it worth it. As far as how I use it, I do use the battery sometimes if I'm just kind of being lazy. If I'm at the range for a long time, though, I just have a, a you know plug that I use, and then I just plug it into my battery pack, and I'm good to go so that it's always charging and always there. A couple of little quirks that you do have to be aware of, though. When you're shooting on it and you're collecting data, if you power it off or you disconnect the power, uh, it is not going to save that file automatically. You have to make sure that you go to the next file so that it saves everything, then you can power it down. Um, I have had that happen in the beginning where you know I did a bunch of shooting and I wasn't thinking and I powered it off without saving that file. So it does not automatically save the current file that you're in. Maybe current, you know, uh, future firmwares will, will change that. But as of right now, that's that's not like the only, I'd say, annoying thing about it. Um, but once you get used to it, you just you hit this button, which moves you forward to the next file, and it says, "Great, you saved it." And then you can shut down, and you've got all your data saved. Uh, navigating the menu, a lot of people talk about the screen and how small it is. I just don't have a problem. Uh, you know, for anything that I need to look at, it's perfectly legible. Um, I have no problem cycling through the menus now that I'm used to um, how these menus work. And um, I don't know, like it's just not a big deal for me. Uh, but I know everybody's going to be a little different and everybody wants a slightly different interface and, and that's fine. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing just doesn't bother me. Um, I've learned to just kind of let some of this stuff go. And, and I think that's just kind of what you have to do. So... Um, you know, that's, that's all I have on that. Uh, it does have a little cheat card. We've talked about this. So if you want to, you know, kind of remember like what your different signals are and, and you know, what it's reading, that's fine. Uh, he did add, I think I talked about this last time, but you can now choose between ES and SD. You can't see them both at once. Um, but you can choose which one you would like to see. Uh, the mounts. So let's talk about the mounts for a minute. So I'll just give you guys a couple of, um, well, actually, i got to show you on here. I'll just give you a couple ideas. So right now, this is what I do. I just keep this in my range bag. I've got a little pocket on the front that this slides in. Uh, this piece right here is his, and it just goes onto any standard tripod, quarter 20 or whatever this, I think it's quarter 20, um, threading right there. So it's super easy. Um, pretty much any, every tripod I've used uh, has a mount that fits that perfectly. And so all I do is just set this up uh, right next to my barrel, and I can make an adjustment on it real easily if I need to, you know, change the angle. Sorry, I hit the camera there. If I need to change the angle or anything like that, it's super easy to do. This just hangs off on the side of it. And, you know, it just sits there like this next to my barrel and I don't, ha I, I just don't have any issues. Again, I have used it literally on the ground in front of a gun. Um, I've, you know, when I travel and if I don't have my, my tripod with me, um, I've just grabbed like, you know, a book or, uh, something that I, uh, an ammo box if I need to and just put it up next to the barrel if I really want to. But the other mounts, so I honestly haven't used the other mounts too much and here's why. On an F-Class gun, there's very little rail space compared to like a PRS gun where you've got a lot more rail systems going on. And I broke, so this is, uh, wait, how does this one go? So this one, this one sits like this so that this goes on your rail and this hangs off the side of the gun. And when I first got it, I used this and I was like, oh man, this is awesome. It's tiny and it fits. It was like the only mount that would fit on my pick rail uh, when I had a scope mounted uh, easily. But uh, after, you know, a week or two of testing or whatever it was, I did break it. So I wrote to him and he goes, well, he goes, this really isn't meant for long term use. This is more meant like a hunting mount or this would be the kind of mount that you want to use if I'm traveling where you're going to take a couple shots, but not like serious abuse because it's so thin. This is really the mount that you want to use. And I have used this one where it goes around your, um, around your scope. And he's got different size rings that you can, um, use with it here. And you can see, um, you know, whatever you need. And, and I have used this one and you can leave this on your gun pretty easily. So this would just go on your, on your scope. And you can leave it, and then when you want to use the uh, chronograph, you just throw this on, and then you can hang this right off the side of your gun. So you can just, you know, it just goes like this, and it's super easy off the side of your gun. And uh, I just don't use it, but it is a good mount. Um, I have tested with it. I have no problems. 
it really does help you when you use one of these, especially if you have a, like a, a gun that's got uh, like a PRS style gun that's got more like forward mounted pick rails or something where you can really utilize one of these other mounts. I will say it really takes 100% of the guesswork out of aiming the thing. That being said, I don't have any trouble aiming this on the tripod. I just get it in, in alignment with the barrel. Um, I don't really give it too much angle, but it's right next to the barrel. And he's got some measurements. I think it's like 10 to 20 centimeters uh, is kind of your range that you can be in. And that's easy to do, so I don't have any problems. Uh, but uh, if you're using one of the rail-mounted systems or scope-mounted systems, that gets you like right in, uh, right in the range there that you need to. And he includes a ton of stuff to you know, kind of customize. You can take apart a lot of this stuff and reconfigure it so that you find one that fits your needs. Uh, again, this is the only thing where I'd caution you that it's not meant for um, sustained fire, especially heavy, heavy recoil. Um, and the fact that I'm free recoiling probably doesn't help this either because what happens is when this is mounted, it's got some flex to it, right? So as I'm free recoiling, it's, blah, 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 you know, it's kind of going wah, wah, wah in there. Um, whereas this has twice the amount of meat it's a lot, a lot more rigid for the needs, uh, but it is 3D printed, so it's easy for him to just send replacements if you need to, um, and he gives you a ton of stuff to work with, so um, not that big a deal. The instruction manual, I don't remember where I put the instruction manual. I guess I should have had that ready to show you, but the instruction manual is, oh heck, I don't remember where I put it, I'm sorry, but um, it's a fully featured instruction manual. It's got everything that you need. Is it hiding under here? Yeah, I don't remember where I put it. Anyway, um, the instruction manual is, is like super overkill. He has all of the technical data. I show this in my other video, so you know, if you want to see it, go back and look at my other videos. But he's got, and it's on his website too, but he's got so much technical data. And to be honest, a lot of it's kind of above my head. But he, um, you know, is a physics professor at the university there. He has access to some crazy machinery to do his testing. And he clearly has done his homework on it. So uh, if, if you're into that kind of stuff and you want to just get data overload, uh, take a look at that manual. It also goes through everything that you need to know on, you know, how to read every chart that's on here when it pops up and, you know, what that means and, and how to tune it and stuff like that. Uh, all of that being said, you don't have to understand all that to get this to work. It is a relatively simple unit, and as long as you're following some basic steps that he lays out at the beginning of the manual, you're not going to have a problem. Uh, but there's going to be guys, and there always are, that really want to, you know, like take it to the N plus one on on the usage, and you know, the fact that he gives you all that data is great. Let me show you real quick, because you know, here's the elephant in the room. How does it compare to Lab Radar? Well, they're both Doppler radars, but Doppler is only as good as how you set up or it's only as accurate, or it only reports uh, how you program it to read. So uh, some units, and there's more than one Doppler out there now, uh, so they're all going to do a little bit different. Some are going to take a reading further down range and then kind of calculate backwards to muzzle. Some are going to attempt to capture the bullet closer to the muzzle without doing any uh, you know, backtracking. And so there is going to be some variance, but I think what's important, uh, and we're going to look here in a second, is that the consistency. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, just a very simple test that I did, but I think it'll illustrate everything that you're wondering. Here is I have Lab Radar and then Andy Scan. I had them both running up concurrently while I did this test. And, and but you can see there's quite a bit of data here. And, you know, I, I left the data like exactly how it came off of both units. I think the biggest thing you'll see out of the gate is, you know, and I'm using on the Lab Radar, I had the trigger set up. On the Andy scan, it's just set up right next to the barrel. And you can see here, these are all missed. Anytime you see this here, like that one, uh, this one up here, these are all missed data points from the, um, the lab radar. And I like to think that I'm pretty adept at using the lab radar. And for whatever reason, it was just struggling this day. So you can see these are all missed data points. So as we look down the right side, this is gonna be your variant. So Here's the lab radar data, here's the Andy scan data, and then this is the difference in feet per second. And like I was talking about, it's, it's about consistency, and you'll see pretty much everything's right here. There's a couple down here that are like 11, 12, 13, but everything's pretty much in like 13 to 15 range. Um, some are a little higher, some are a little lower, 
But, you know, to me, what that says is that uh, between the two, you know, it's very accurate in ter- or not very accurate, but very repeatable. So whether you're using the lab radar or using the Andy scan, this variant says that they are both very repeatable in what they are picking up, even if the data doesn't completely align. And and again, I know I'm going to get fried for this by people, but I just I don't care. I don't I don't care that they're not exactly the same because I understand they're using different methodology to arrive at their values in terms of, you know, how how one is, you know, taking a reading further out and then extrapolating data back at the muzzle, whereas the the anti scan is trying to get it closer to the muzzle. Uh, but that can cause a little more variance simply because um, where it's catching the bullet um, can vary just a little bit. So there's going to be some variance on both sides. But the fact that these numbers are really consistent across quite a few. In fact, what are we looking at? A total of 52 data point. Well, I guess over here, 50, uh, 52 data points. Um, you know, that tells me that, uh, you know, that it's that it's very consistent in terms of what you're going to get a reading for. And so how does that affect me now? Well, when I'm when I'm using my Andy scan, I just know that the numbers I get on my Andy scan are what I'm shooting for. I, I don't care that they might be five or 10 feet per second up or down from some other measuring device. Um, all I know is that I'm getting consistent data off of it. And so that's what I'm going to use for my records. So hopefully this helps give you a little bit of confidence that that both units, in fact, but especially the Andy scan, since it's the newest on the block, is giving you repeatable, um, consistent data. And, you know, for me, this test, and I've done this test a bunch. This one just happened to be the one I had available for this video. Uh, but this is what I found over and over and over again. And and that just led me to feel very confident in the data. So let's head back and take a look at um, some final thoughts here. All right, so that gives you an idea. And look, I've I, I've done a bunch of head-to-head testing with it. I've done head-to-head testing against Magneto Speed. It's very consistent. And for me, I don't, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we are all dealing with slightly extrapolated numbers. For me, what's important is, does it record consistently so that I can feel like when I'm uh, going out there and getting my data, that it is going to be repeatable uh, day-to-day, load-to-load, stuff like that. And I I 100% have confidence in it. Um, The fact that it records at a slightly different velocity I mean, that's just the way it is because they're using different algorithms with how they calculate their their radar. Um, So that's it. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but it does come in kind of a nice little cardboard box. And he does include a um, memory card reader because you can pull out the SD card that's inside. It does have a user replaceable battery in it if, if you do find that the recharge isn't holding. So I think... You know, all in all, he's he's kind of gone and, and kind of figured out, like, the little things that people are looking for. You know, the question is, is it worth it? You know, I, I, I want to say at this point in time, uh, it's somewhere in that $800, $900 U.S. range, if I remember right. Um, don't quote me, but, um, you know, there are some conversions in place and, and stuff, so it can vary. But here's how I look at it. He gives you everything you need out of the box. You have mounts, you have batteries. Um, this Obviously, this is extra, but uh, he does give you everything else that you need out of the box to be successful. So let's just say it's even $900, you know, by the time you get it shipped to you. And people say, well, but, you know, that's like twice what a lab radar is. Well, not really. Uh, a lab radar right now, if you can find the Bluetooth version, is going to be $600. Uh, you either have to use double A's or you're going to end up buying a battery pack, which technically you don't need a battery pack for this. Um, you could easily charge this and, and go to the range for most uses and not have a problem. So you're not going to have to buy a whatever, $25 to $50 battery pack. Uh, you don't have to buy a stand of any kind, which can run $50 to $100 bucks depending on what you're buying. You don't have to buy a case for it, which is another you know $40 to $70, depending on what kind of case you buy. So... You know, very quickly that 600 becomes, you know, almost $800 by the time you have accessories. So the price difference, while still more, is not nearly as egregious as people make it out. It's just a different unit and you just have to gauge whether it's, it's going to fit your needs. Now, if a lab radar works and you can pick one up used and, you know, it's, and it truly is half the price and it's all you need, then great. Um, but if you are looking for something that is, uh, you know, a little bit more cutting edge, Size factor 100% matters to me, so I would easily pay a couple hundred bucks more just for the size factor um, on top of the functionality that it provides. 
you know, so in my case, it's totally worth it. It may not be in your case, and that's fine too. Um, you know, you can still buy some very good basic screen chronographs for a couple hundred bucks, uh, probably less on the used market. So there are chronographs for every budget and every need. This is going to be, uh, you know, kind of top end. It's going to be smaller. It's going to be more feature packed. It's going to do different things than you're used to. And in those cases, yes, it's going to be worth it. So anyway, I just wanted to do a kind of a follow up. A lot of people have been asking, are you still using it? Yes, it is 100% my daily chronograph. I do not literally leave home without it anymore because it just goes in the bottom of my bag and, uh, you know, I kind of forget that it's even there half the time and, oh, I want to take a reading. Great. Let me pull it out. Um, you know, I was at a match, uh, not long ago and something had gone haywire in my ammo and, you know, near the end of the match, I had, I had finished shooting my final string and I talked to the match director said, Hey, you know, like everybody's pretty much done shooting. Can I just throw a couple rounds over a chronograph and see what's going on? He goes, yeah, sure. Um, you know, so, uh, I've just had it with me. I normally wouldn't bring a chronograph with me to a match like that. I was able to pull it out, put a couple rounds over it and, Really, uh, just those two or three rounds that I shot gave me a ton of data as far as what had gone on in terms of uh, speeding up or slowing down. I can't remember which it was, but um, it was just nice to have. So, you know, there you go. That's the Andy scan. Uh, you know, I, uh, I think it's great. So uh, if you've been looking for something different, if you've been holding off, uh, this may just be what you're looking for. You guys have a good one. We'll talk later.